You're watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And I'm back with Dr. David Grinspoon, author of Chasing New Horizons Inside the Epic First Mission to Pluto. Now, Doctor, say that there are. Say that the, the answer to the Fermi Paradox is, as you say, we just haven't looked well enough yet and that we'll find it. Should we proactively try to contact something if we found it? In other words, Medi. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and it's currently controversial uh, in, amongst the SETI community of whether we should be not just listening, but broadcasting. I think um, ultimately we should probably not just listen, but be broadcasters. But I also kind of, I agree with the people that say, well, let's wait, have a bit of a moratorium until we're able to have some kind of a global consensus on how we do this and what kind of messages we send and, you know, whether we just think it's a good idea. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One is the argument, it's similar to the planetary protection argument we were discussing with regards to bringing samples back from Mars. Maybe you have the possibility of triggering something and it doesn't seem very likely that there would be a problem, but if there was a problem, it could be a serious problem. You know, like you don't want to bring something back from Mars and have it wipe out all life on Earth. Even though it doesn't seem likely, you recognize that would be a very bad thing to do, so you're careful. So there's a similar argument with Medi where people say, okay, chances are there aren't evil aliens out there wanting to kill anyone who sends a signal. But there's some models there. There's even some, you know, some explanations for uh, the, the Fermi paradox that say, well, the reason why we don't see or hear anyone is because nobody's on the air because either everyone's being careful because they know it's not a good idea because of what's out there or the ones that broadcast have been wiped out by something and you know there's some some science fictional scenarios for um, things like berserkers which are these you know super advanced uh, civilizations with machines that basically go go and wipe out every young broadcasting civilization so that there won't be any threat of them becoming something powerful now, I don't really subscribe to that as a likely scenario, but can, can I say there's zero chance of something dangerous like that out there? No, of course I can't. And so then some people make the argument, well, then, so who are you to decide for the human race you're going to take that risk? And, you know, it's an interesting argument. I, to me, the, the counter argument is like, well, you can't be too careful. You can't, you know, avoid all risk. You would never leave the house in the morning if, if your whole goal in life was to avoid risk, but you you're curious and you want to explore the universe. And so, you know, with that's, that's what we do. And ultimately I think that that logic will and should prevail, but I'm not opposed to the idea of, Hey, well, let's at least try to have some global consensus about this. And partly because I think it's a good idea. Just in general, we have to practice trying to get our act together on a global scale for problems like climate change and, and other problems. And so why not use the Medi question as sort of a teachable moment and say, okay, well, can we, because you're sort of inherently acting for Earth if you send a message to some other system. So why not try to, you know, at least have some, it's not like we're going to be able to get some perfect global consensus where everybody gets a vote. We don't know how to do that, but at least we could have some international consultation and try to like, like at least have some um, effort at making an inclusive global um, act when we decide to undertake a Medi program. So I guess that would be my, my answer would be like, yeah, let's do it, but what's the hurry? Let's go about it in the right way. And then even if we don't contact aliens, we at least have made some kind of a progress in being a more coherent presence here on Earth, which is its own reward. Now, we have actually sent out signals uh, before, Medi signals, the Arecibo signal being the most yes. famous one. Yes. But maddeningly, for some alien civilization, we didn't repeat it. <laughs> so it's it's some civilization's wow signal if anybody ever picks it up. Yeah, no, that's a good point, because we one of our criterion for, for a signal being real is that it's repeated, right? And so... We have violated that <laughs> from the other end of the 
agreement. Yeah, I mean, the, the things that we've sent out so far have been more symbolic than real efforts to begin a dialogue. In fact, that you know, the Arecibo message was sent towards this star cluster 30, what, 30,000 light years away, but it was sent in a way that did not include the proper motion of those stars. And so, in fact, it's going to miss by a wide mark. It's going to be where that star cluster, you know, it aimed um, where, where that cluster would have been 30,000 years ago, or, 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 or at, rather at the time of, of sending it. So it was really done as a, as a symbolic effort and, and not even really done carefully in a way that were they worried about, is this actually going to reach those stars? So um, there have been a few things like that and a few other things you might describe as stunts. Um, or, you know, the, the, um, in uh, Russia, they did this teenage message where they got teenagers involved and sent some, in designing a message and sent it out to some nearby stars. And, you know, it was just kind of fun that, that, that involvement, inclusiveness is kind of the thing that, you know, it's similar to what I was advocating. But, um, but again, that was not repeated and it was sort of a one off. And so these things have not really raised Earth's visibility on galactic scale in a significant way. But some of these MEDI programs people are proposing were like, yeah, let's blast powerful signals in a repeated way at the nearby habitable planets. That is a change in Earth's visibility in the galaxy. And the argument that some people have made is like, well, before we go and on behalf of Earth, change Earth's visibility in a really significant way, let's at least try to get some um, some buy-in on a widespread global scale of that, that act. Now, that raises an interesting point, because outside of Medi, we are betrayed by Earth's biosignatures, and it's been that way long enough for anybody in the Milky Way that's got a big enough telescope to know about it. Our weird oxygen and methane levels are detectable. I would imagine our vegetative red edge would be detectable at a distance. So probably if there's something out there, it already knows about us if it's advanced enough, wouldn't you think? Yeah. I mean, so that's that's a good argument, and yeah, yeah we're... Uh, you know, if we were alien astrobiologists uh, looking at Earth, we'd say, hey, look at all that oxygen and look at the chlorophyll, look at the ozone layer, look at Earth's red edge, and maybe even look at all those television and radio signals. So we're not, we're not hidden. But there's a difference between that and sort of blasting our presence out to the cosmos. In other words, uh, just take the radio signals that we've already been put out there. We're not silent, but the number of stars in which there would be a significant signal that you could notice and pick that up with a certain kind of search is not that great. And if we go and start deliberately broadcasting, then we vastly increase that visibility. So it's true that we're not completely hidden and that we would be detectable by somebody with a certain level of sophistication out there actively searching for us. But it's still we're talking about changing by many orders of magnitude uh, our visibility amongst those that might not yet be aware of our presence. So, I mean, both are true. It's true that we're not completely hidden and that we are findable by those looking for us in a certain way. But it's also true that if we, we did start broadcasting our presence, it would um, drastically change our visibility for, you know, most places in the galaxy. Now, what sort of energy levels are we talking about with Medi? Are they wanting to really put a very powerful omnidirectional beacon out there, or do they want to just sort of target it towards certain star systems that look like good candidates for having habitable worlds? Yeah, yeah. The proposals I've heard of have been for targeted uh, transmissions at places that that we've discovered habitable habitable worlds through through other other means. So, yeah, it's not a it's not an omnidirectional. I, I don't think. There are proposals out there that um, the ones that I'm most familiar with are not for omnidirectional signals, but they're more for sort of lighting ourselves up in the direction of certain places that seem potentially promising that might not have noticed us <laughs> up to this point. So they're probably not that dangerous anyway, because they're essentially sh shots in the dark. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm not I'm not kept awake at night by the danger of that at all. I'm just sympathetic to the argument, as long as we're going to do it, let's make it a, a sort of globally sanctioned act to the extent we can, rather than something that seems like a rogue effort when you're sort of inherently speaking for Earth if you're doing this. 
So why not make some effort to be to be speaking for Earth rather than just yourself? So essentially, it, it needs to be something that is agreed on in the UN or somebody like that if we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, the UN or maybe even just set up a process of that that's its own thing where you announce, hey, we, we want to do this in five years and and here's the website where you and your country can get involved in the discussion of what we should say or make an argument if you really don't want us to do this, you know, but not that everybody necessarily gets a veto, but you, you know, you try to have some discussion and some inclusion. I've not hit upon the exact best method of doing this. I just think that it's worth putting some effort into trying to do it right. Now, what if we pick up a signal? What do we do? Do we just, whoever picks it up, announces it publicly, or is there a better way to do it? More, you know, hand it to the UN Secretary General or something like that to sort of announce to the globe that we found something. How's that going to happen? There is a protocol for that. And the protocol is that you, when you first detect it, you don't announce it to the world because you're not sure if it's real. You verify that it's real. And you do that by first you call other observatories and you get them to look for it. And then that solves the problem of it being a local phenomenon. And you sort of do various things to make sure it's not local make sure it's not interference, make sure it's not a hoax. And then once you determine that, then you quickly tell everyone you alert the world. And that's that's the protocol that I mean, it's written down in more detailed form than that. that that's basically it. Total transparency. Once you're sure that you're right, you don't just announce it when you think you might be right, because, you, you know, that would be damaging. Uh, if uh you know to credibility and you don't want to create a false alarm but but once you're sure that you found something that's clearly an artificial signal um there's very much a um, a policy of uh, transparency let's not keep this a secret there's no point in trying to keep it a secret beyond a certain point so so you verify that it's real and then you tell everyone but that isn't that all we're gonna know so say a signal is found that's unambiguously of alien origin would we ever even be able to decipher it or would we simply say you know if someone says well what's the civilization like or like well the only thing we know is they have radar because that's what we picked up so what what could we ever even hope to learn if we did get a signal well you know there's there's a lot of possibilities there's a possibility of a very low information signal where the only thing we know is that it seems to be a signal or it's not even a signal it's an artifact maybe they're not trying to contact us maybe we're seeing some leakage from their civilization of their own communication with it with themselves in which case if it's not designed to be deciphered by aliens in this case we're the aliens it probably would be undecipherable so there's a whole scenario in which there's a very low information detection where all we know is that there is somebody out there that's there's clearly some phenomena out there that is not um, natural that's a result of some alien technology that even that would be a very profound discovery that would create a big mystery but would also um, answer a fundamental question about our nature, you know, that we're not not the only example of a certain kind of phenomenon um, would be huge. But there's also the possibility of a, of a much higher information signal. Uh, you know, by analogy, when we imagine sending signals, the top few signals we have sent, like Arecibo and so forth, we try to design, a lot of thought goes into how would you design a signal so it could be decipherable by somebody that we don't really know anything about them other than the fact that they are capable of picking up a radio signal. So if they've put the same thought and effort into that, it's conceivable that we pick up a signal that is meant to be deciphered by somebody that doesn't know anything about the sender. And there are various, there's a whole body of theory about how you would design a signal and sort of build up a decipherable language within that signal and a lot of it's based on sort of the idea that there's mathematical principles and physical principles that are universal that would be recognizable by another technological civilization that has figured out some of the same things about the universe that we've figured out so if you buy that then it's possible we'd find a signal that was designed to be picked up and interpreted and then could have a whole lot of information about the uh, the senders and other information too about what they've learned about the universe so you know there's everything from a signal that we have no ability to interpret other than just recognizing somebody's out there and that's all we know and the other opposite end of the spectrum is that they've sent us the encyclopedia galactica 
with all the combined knowledge of like, you know, all the ancient civilizations in the galaxy that have all joined together and decided to send out all the information to young civilizations. You know, those are the sort of two extremes and there's every every uh, possibility in between those two extremes as well. <laughs> or or something even closer to home. Some people, we touched on uh, von Neumann probes and you could <laughs> go out, find an alien von Neumann probe in your solar system and the only thing it tells you is the entire history of your planet that it's been recording <laughs> and nothing else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they, they've been recording our history in their, for, for their own purposes, and that's, that's all that's contained in it. That in itself would be pretty interesting, but it would also be like, oh, my God, we found aliens, and they're just telling us about ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're, they're like, our gift to you is pictures of dinosaurs. Um, that, that wouldn't be too bad. It wouldn't be too bad, but it would definitely be puzzling. Although I guess you could tell something about them from their technology that they used right. in the construction right. of the, the probe. Now, out of the signals, candidate signals or false alarms and all that, one stands out, the wow signal. And it still stands out to this day. Do you think it's very unlikely that that was anything? Or do you think that might have been it? I think that could have been something technological doesn't seem to me like it was a signal designed to be detected but it could have easily been some bit of internal communication you know ship to ship communication or something that was not really designed to be detected but it was leaked out um and that it's got the characteristics of that it was an energetic burst seemed like a signal but it was very momentary and never repeated and of course, if you're if you're accidentally leaking a you know some kind of an internal communication that just for one instant is pointing in the right direction uh, um, towards Earth, then that's that's exactly what it would look like. So um, to me, it's consistent with it being an artifact, but it's not evidence of that. And I don't think we're ever going to really. I mean, it, it's worth you know periodically people look in that same direction just in case it's worth looking but i i would guess that that's just a one-off that we'll never never really know about the wow signal and people will interpret it how they want and we got to keep looking for something that is more verifiable yeah especially since i mean the wow signal is weird because it's at 1420 megahertz the hydrogen line and it was narrow band and it just had all these hallmarks but at the same time if the signal only repeats once every 300 years, then you're not going to see it, even if it does repeat. So you have to ask yourself, what cycle would aliens repeat a signal at? And there's, I Yeah, no, I mean, it doesn't strike me as a repeating signal at all. And so therefore, you know, what good is it? <laughs> but, but it was probably not designed for the purpose of alerting others to their presence. That's what, that's what I think, is that if it was a bit of technological signal that was designed for some other purpose. Are there any other signals or detections of something that have also made you go, hmm, I wonder? There, you know, there there are a few um, interesting observations about how in the aggregate there are, if you look at the pattern of all the sort of false alarms in like the SETI home search and those, the pattern lines up in an interesting way with the disk of the galaxy and with the presence of stars and makes you, you know, there, there's some sort of weak correlations like that that are, again, kind of consistent with the possibility that, you know, maybe we're sort of detecting these threshold events. But there's nothing, um, there's nothing as good as the wow signal, which, again, you know, you might call that the great silence, but it's to me, it's not all that great. We really haven't been looking that long. We don't even know. Maybe they're not using radio at all. Maybe that's just our current level of understanding of the universe makes that seem like a good idea. You know, Kokoni and Morrison wrote this paper in Nature in 1959 where they talked about how reasonable it was to look with radio because, you know, we now have the technology in hand that if somebody across the galaxy had the same technology, we could talk to each other. And it was a very persuasive paper, and it spawned this whole field of SETI, really. But, you know, maybe uh, the aliens don't read Nature magazine. <laughs> and maybe, maybe they have some other way of communicating based on what they know about the universe. Or maybe they choose not to communicate. And maybe they, you know, there's this idea of the Kardashev scale that, that civilizations will get more and more um, visible energy intensive 
use more and more energy as they become more advanced. But I, I really question whether that would be the nature of um, long-lived civilizations. Based on you know our current situation here on Earth, we're learning that a ethos of continual expansion and energy use is not necessarily a wise way to become a so-called advanced civilization. Maybe they'll value sustainability a lot more. And maybe the really advanced civilizations, meaning the long-lived ones who have figured out how to how to survive over you know cosmological timescales, maybe um, the way they do it is by becoming more steady state and more sustainable and not uh, as noticeable. Maybe maybe really noticeable civilizations are inherently self-destructive. I mean, I don't know if that's true either. It's it's simply a conjecture, just as the Kardashev scale is a conjecture. But there. Are, there are scenarios along which the universe could be full of technological civilizations that are just not visible to us in the way we imagine that they should be. Well, that's one one thing I've thought about is that if you had a civilization that was so advanced that they they conquered nanotechnology and uploaded themselves into the nano cloud, it, they would look like a fog bank. <laughs> that's all you would see. Maybe some RF uh, emissions, but it would look like a fog bank. And right, right. I mean, that's that's an interesting possibility. And, you know, there's so many interesting possibilities. But the point is, we have such a, a narrow sliver in time and we're, we're observing one civilization for a narrow sliver of time. And even just observing ourselves, look at the pace of technological change. Can we predict the nature of human technology 10,000 years from now or 100,000 years from now? Of course not. And that's human technology. So then how could we predict the nature of an alien technology that's uh, a million years separated from us in time. You know, we just, I don't think our imagination is up for the task. So we, we, um, we just don't know. And that's why I think the, the, the search is a good idea because ultimately the way we'll learn the answers is not by conjecturing, but by, by finding something and then interpreting what, it, what we find. And to tie it all back, I, I, I've always wondered if I even really want to know if there's an alien civilization out there, because as, as we were talking, it could be scary. But what I really want to know is if the microbes are out there, because if we find microbes uh, distinct from Earth in our solar system, then chances are the universe teems with microbial life. That's right. And I think that's, that's the one I want, to, I want to answer is... Do we have microbes? Yeah, well, it's 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 uh, you're absolutely right. That if you know, say if we found microbes on Mars, you know, first of all, they're either going to be related to us or they're not. Either one is a profound discovery. But if we find microbes on the planet next door, or you know, really even any other place in our solar system, that implies a universe that is just rich with life, and that's an amazing thing to discover. And I think that that is a discovery we could well make in our lifetimes, and and that in addition to just being an amazing discovery in and of itself, the implications are staggering because it, it staggers. If, if, the, if the universe is that full of life, then everything that could evolve is evolving somewhere. And then, you know, the possibilities, uh, all of these possibilities are, you know, they start to seem almost inevitable rather than far-fetched that somewhere, if, if life is evolving everywhere, then there are all these little experiments and an evolution going on all over the cosmos. and so many places that you know you, you can't even imagine the number of places and therefore who knows what's being cooked up around the galaxy and the other the other advantage to the to microbes is that you have two ways to answer it you, you know you can go to space and look for them but the scientists working on the origins of life on earth also are getting closer to having an understanding of how it started here in which case we can say that's really hard and not very likely to happen very often or it's very easy and it's probably everywhere. Yeah, if we crack that mystery of the origin of life and we can say with more certainty these are the conditions that it takes, then that's also something we can apply our our growing knowledge of extraterrestrial environments towards uh, you know, informing ourselves of where of how common those kinds of environments are, which maybe isn't the same as discovering life, but as you say, it's significant for for answering these questions. And it's very likely to be answered sooner rather than later. You know, on order of decades, we may know these answers. Something to look forward to. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, thank you for joining us today, Doctor.
Oh, thanks. I've enjoyed the conversation. Me too. And I hope you come back with us. Um, everybody check out David Grinspoon's new book with Alan Stern, Chasing New Horizons Inside the Epic First Mission to Pluto, which tells the story of the New Horizons probe and our first visit to uh, Pluto. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now. <laughs>